year of Jubilee. I was describing this to a friend of mine yesterday who is a seeker. He's not really a dedicated Christian. And he asked me what I was preaching on, going to be preaching on today. And I told him forgiveness. And I said, I want to bring up the year of Jubilee. He said, what is that? Now, every 49 years in ancient Israel, they would blow a trumpet. And it was really a cool trumpet to blow because when they blew that trumpet, all your debts were canceled. How would you like if that happened today? Your mortgage payment, gone, okay? But also with that, there was a return of property to the original owner. Sometimes people would put up property as a bind for their, their debt, and sometimes it was taken away. And so on the blowing of the, the year of Jubilee trumpet, then it was returned to the owner. So the year of Jubilee did a couple of things, two of which I would just bring up. Number one, it kept the inheritance in the family. That was so important to them to understand the inheritance was not going to be taken away. So whatever your inheritance was, if someone in your family had, in the last 49 years, had put it up as a bind or put it up as collateral and it was taken away from you, 49th year, they'd blow that trumpet, okay, on that 50th year, you would receive your property back and your debt was canceled. That was good. But I think it's also a picture of the fact that sometimes we get weighed down in life with heavy burdens. And that's like if you pictured a person with great debt, it's a, there's a lot of burden, there's a heavy burden there. And so in the year of Jubilee, when they blew the trumpet, <laughs> it just goes. And I can tell by the way that I bring it up and say all debts were canceled, I can see the looks on people's face. Boy, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, maybe we ought to re-implement that today and just blow the year of Jubilee trumpet and say all debts are canceled. By the way, a little preface, a little sneak in here. That's what exactly uh, the, uh, the classes that we have on debt canceling from Dave Ramsey. Okay, how's that? <laughs> okay, we again would like to know more about if anybody was interested. Anyway, in Acts chapter 13, uh, this is still in preface where we're going, but it said, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, okay, we're talking about the incarnation and about forgiveness. Okay, so... The apostle is here talking, and he says, through this man, who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Through this man is the fact that forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Now, I did a little study on what do we call forgiveness. And let me just point out a couple of things when we talk about forgiveness and how it looks. In general, forgiveness is described this way and as a definition. Forgiveness is the release of resentment or anger. That's why when we call on people to forgive, it's a release of that anger or resentment that you have, because that will kill you. That's called bitterness, when you hold on to it. Uh, a working definition in the world is like this. What is forgiveness? Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or a group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Okay. Divine forgiveness, then. Biblical definition of divine forgiveness is that God re restores a relationship with those who have been removed, uh, have, excuse me, that God's restored the relationship with those who have caused a removal of themselves from his fellowship because of guilt. So he removes the object of that guilt to bring us into full-fledged relationship with him. How's it look? Remember the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was having dinner with this Pharisee one time. That would have been an interesting case, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? A Pharisee. The Pharisees hated Jesus. You wonder how much he was there, invited him over so he could trap him at what he was saying. Nevertheless, as he's eating, and it must have been in the outer court of his house because a woman came by and immediately went to the feet of Jesus and washed his feet with the tears that flowed down her face and wiped his feet with the hairs of her head and anointed him his feet with precious oil. The Pharisee questioned Jesus and in his mind thought, if Jesus really knew all things. He would know that this woman was the scum of the earth, and he should not even touch her, let alone have her touch him. Jesus knew what he was thinking, and so Jesus pointed to him, and he said, got a question for you. 
If a man owned, owed a debt of $500, another man owed $50, and both were forgiven of their debt, which one would be really, really thankful? Which one would show more gratitude? And he said, well, the man who owed the greater debt. And he said, well, it's interesting. I came to your house, and you neither provided me water to wash my feet, nor anointed me with oil, which was the custom to show that this was a, a really important guest. He said, since I have come here, this woman has not ceased to wash my feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair and anoint my feet with precious ointment. He looked at the woman and said, depart in peace. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. You know, that's what the church is. We're all a bunch of sinners. We're blasphemers. We're traitors. We've taken God's word and taken it through the mud in the way that we live our lives. And yet we come back to this and say, we desperately need forgiveness. And that place of forgiveness is found in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much do we need forgiveness? You see, that is the greatest need we have. Remember the time in Mark chapter 2 when the disciples were there and all, everybody was here to see Jesus and they were all clumped into one building and remember the brothers that had a paralyzed brother? They got real creative. They went to the top of the building and then peeled back the roof and let their brother down before Jesus. And Jesus, what was Jesus' first words? What were Jesus' first words to that man? Your sins be forgiven you. Well, that made the Pharisees all kind of, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nobody can forgive sins but God himself, right? What is he doing here? And Jesus knew that, and he says, which is easier to me to say, son, your sins be forgiven you, or rise, take up your bed, and walk? Well, of course it's easier to say your sins be forgiven you, because who would know? But if he says, rise, take up your bed, and walk, a man better be taken up his bed and walk, or else he's a liar. So then he says this, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, I say to you, son, rise, take up your bed, and walk. As you look at that, what's the greatest need? The greatest need that man had was not to walk. The greatest need that man had was to have his sins forgiven. Likewise us. We're kind of like coming before God, even as we come to worship, we're kind of like described in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, there was a priest by the name of Joshua. And it says that he went to before God and he had filthy garments. And it says there that the Son of God, or actually he was called the, the, um, the captain of the Lord's hosts, okay, he is the angel of the Lord, He's standing there, and so is Satan. And Satan is accusing him and saying, look, how can he, how can this man conduct worship? Look at his garments. So the command is going, change his garments to clean garments. And that's you and me. As we come to worship God, <laughs> we have stains of garments of our sin and our disgusting things we've thought or spoken this week. And we may be saying, and Satan would accuse us and say, what right does that person have to come to the throne of God and worship? And yet Jesus says, put on these garments, the garments of his righteousness. And as we stand before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we know that we are accepted. So, as we look at this text of Scripture then, it really is based on the gospel. The gospel, of the, the, through this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. And so we're going to break down Romans chapter, eight, or chapter 10, verses 8 through 13, looking at the word of forgiveness in verse 8, the value of confession in verses 9 and 10, and the assurance of forgiveness in verses 11 through 13. Let's read it. Follow with me in your copy of God's word, or in the outline that's been presented to you. But what does it say, verse 8? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's begin by just breaking down the first verse there, verse 8 that we read. Verse 8, the need for the word is really our default mode of life. There's something in us that seeks to establish our own righteousness. When you talk to people of whether they need God, they don't need God because they're doing all right. And even when presented about God's holiness and how they're going to one day stand before God, they'll look at them and say, well... I believe it's kind of like a weight of, you know, a scale, that if I do enough good works, I'll outweigh my bad things. Okay, the problem is that the scale is so tipped to the bad things, we could never do enough good works and be pleasing to God. But here's what it says. The scripture then, if we back up to chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, listen to these words. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, Israel, is that they might be saved. I bear, them record that, uh, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the, uh, of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, they're establishing their own righteousness. And that's where people are. They're establishing their own righteousness. And then sometimes it's to bring God down and say, well, I don't believe God can do this, or I don't believe that, you know, these things. And so then they're, they're, or, or lifting themselves up and feeling like they're pretty good people. And that's exactly where, the, that's the default mode that we go to in life. I'm pretty good. I think I'll make it. Okay? But he says here, what was happening is these people, particularly the Jews, they are blinded by that very thing, going about to establish their own righteousness, and which keeps them from submitting to the righteousness of God, which comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Example that we read from Matthew chapter 19, it gives us a good example of how it looks. Remember, as Nick was reading, <coughs> that the young man that came to the Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus told him all these requirements in the law, okay, and I believe what he was doing is, Jesus was doing was instead of giving him every commandment, he was giving him enough that, that would be condemning. And what was his attitude? Yeah, I've kept those. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good and good. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And then Jesus pointed out, no, no, no. No, you're, you're really hung up on this because what you need to do is go sell all that you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. I want total dedication. Okay, what he was saying was he's still caught up in himself. He was establishing his own righteousness. And sometimes we do that. And so what do we need? As it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth, that word of faith that we proclaim. It's the word of faith that we need. So that comes to us in twofold ways. Number one, I call it the spoken word, which is the gospel. The spoken word is described in chapter 10, verse 5. It says, Moses writes about the righteousness is based on the law that a person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down, or that is to bring Christ down. In other words, you're not going to present yourself to God and not say, bring God down lower than us and try to make ourselves acceptable. You just take what it says and understand that God has provided one way of salvation, and that is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in the incarnate one. There's forgiveness in this one man, Jesus Christ. So, we turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. He says, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The declaration that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and he accomplished it. He lived a perfect life. He died a vicarious death. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's all based on Jesus Christ. And if I have any righteousness, it's the righteousness that I have in Jesus Christ. It's not my own righteousness. And so we come down to 1 Corinthians 15, and that's exactly what the gospel is. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So when we turn to this, that's the word spoken. 
the gospel spoken, but it's more than that, as Paul says here in Romans chapter 10. What does it say? The word is near you. That's, you hear it. He says it's in your mouth and in your heart. Uh, wait a minute. How does it go to the heart? Well, that's when we say it's the inner word, and that's the working of the Holy Spirit. I love talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, when it says, We know, brothers, uh, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Many times when you bring up the doctrine of election, People say, oh, well, God is just, you know, somebody wants to be saved, and God is pushing them out. They're not the elect. Well, see, that's a, you, you just described something that is completely false. That's completely, that's not what doctrine of election says. Because the doctrine of election says every one of us hate God. We shake our fist at God. Maybe not literally shake our fist, but we deny him. We don't want to submit to him. We don't want to have anything to do with him until God arrests us and gives us a new heart. When he points to us and says, you're mine. Let's look at that. It says in 1 Thessalonians, we know that the, you've been loved by God, that he's chosen you because our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. That's the time that it's more than just words. You've heard about the doctrine that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. You've heard about the doctrine that he lived a perfect life for us. You've heard the doctrine that... Uh, you are to repent of your sins and follow Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins. He buried, was buried and he rose again the third day. And now he represents you before God so that no condemnation can ever be presented to God to take you away from him. But it doesn't make sense until it comes in power. Boom! That's why it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel is the dynamite, the dynamos, the, the power of God unto salvation. Boom! <laughs> Think about your heart being a hard and stony rock. It's interesting. At one time, Jesus uh, declaring, we'll talk more about this in a moment, about he's the cornerstone. And it says, in, when Jesus was questioned about that, he said, upon whom the rock falls to be crushed to powder. But everyone that comes to that rock will also be broken. If the Holy Spirit leads you to the rock, Jesus Christ, you're broken. Blessed are those who are broken and contrite in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are we when we're broken but the ones who are ground to powder are those who are put under that rock and they will suffer the vengeance of him forever upon whom the rock falls. Oh, okay. Well, it says in John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit, what is he going to do? It says that he is the helper. He will teach us all things and bring to remembrance things that Jesus has spoken. He also tells us in John 16 that he will guide you to the truth and he will glorify me, Jesus said. So putting that all together, we have this tendency then to try to make for our own righteousness, to establish our own righteousness. But God comes to us two ways. Kind of a dual thing here when he comes to us and brings the gospel. Now the gospel is spoken. So I always want to say that that the person that says, well, I may, want to be, I may want to be a child of God, and yet if I'm not the elect, God will throw me out. Well, first of all, if, you've under the, if you're under the sound of the gospel, that's a good thing. Because you, you have a, an evidence that God has been merciful to you. Secondly, if the gospel comes to you in power, that the Holy Spirit has opened your heart, and you've seen it, and respond to it. That's an evidence of God's grace. Here is how it looks. John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13, it says, Jesus came to his own people, but his own people did not receive him. They pushed him away. But, he says, to every one of those who did receive him, to them he gave he the power to be the sons of God. In other words, to come into the family. And he says, which were born, not of bloodline. Not be, they were born not because they were in the right family. They were born not by the will of man because somebody says, yeah, okay, and not because of your own will. Not because somebody else willed it for you, but you're born of God. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So he says here, he says, what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart, that word of faith that we proclaim. It's all about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But let's notice the second thing, the value of confession in verses 9 and 10. And what I'm going to do is, uh, well, let me just read it. Verses 9, 9 and 10, um, actually, yeah, he says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I want to break that down. Let's talk about believing first. Believing is more than just acknowledgement, but it's submission to whatever thing that God has presented before you. It says in the book of Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God, believed the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. What did God say? Well, you know, sometimes we look at Abraham and God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, right? He went to, he didn't know where he was going and God just led him alone. Uh, that was a commendable thing. But when God gave him the insight and the fact that one day he would have a son, and through that son the nations of the world would be blessed, he was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though Abraham was old at the time that he received that, he believed God. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that looks. He just believed God. It's, it's so. I mean, he had seen the fact that God had, had blessed him so much before this, but even on this short journey, he, he was willing to believe something that would happen for years later. He believed God. And he didn't have a son at that time. And it looked like it was impossible for him to have a son at that time. But he believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Now his belief was tested. When that promised son Isaac was born, God said, I want you to go and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Burnt sacrifice. Wow. This is the promise that God had given that one day he would have this, this descendant of his, Isaac, would also be a, from his offspring would come the Lord Jesus Christ, come the Messiah, that all the nations of the world would be blessed. And now he tells him to take him and offer him on the altar as a burnt offering. He was testing his faith. It's interesting that we don't get insight in the book of Genesis as to what Abraham was thinking. All we know is that he told Abraham to do this, and it says the next morning he got up early to do it. Now, you and I would have put it off a lot. <laughs> are you sure about this? Uh, maybe I'm going to check again. Lord, are you sure that you want me to offer this one as a burnt off? No, it says he got up early. Why did he get up early? Because God told him to do something, and he was going to do it. Exactly what God said. That's an evidence that he really, really did believe. He didn't have to question it. He just followed what God had said. But what was he driven by? Well, we find that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. What was the driving factor in, in Abraham's obedience? He knew that, that this one, uh, Isaac, that he came from a dead body, really his. He was too old to have children. His wife was too old to have children. And yet here he was, the promised son. So he just believed, well, if God can do that, if this son dies on the altar, God will raise him up. No problem for him, right? That's so he believed God. And even though he was tested, he continued to believe. Now, where does that belief come from from us? Belief is there because it's a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. By faith, grace are you saved through faith, and that, the faith, the belief, is not of you, it's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. But on the other hand, if God has given you that, James says, if it is not working through you to do something, you don't have real faith. Okay? It's working in you. So keep that in mind. We're talking about belief that's doing something. And that's why he says in Hebrews chapter 1 that, that by faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In Psalm 27, it says, here, listen to this one. It's not on your outline. Uh, David says, you have said... This is talking to the Lord. You have said, seek my face. What's the response? My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. I used to, when I was, um, I think I was in sixth grade or whatever, I, I wanted a paper route, and so I was learning from a guy. I was kind of an apprentice to a guy that was older. He was like a junior in high school. Okay, and he said that, Whenever I say jump, you say how high and start jumping. You know, one of those, you know, he's trying to dominate. I never, I didn't last long as a paper boy. <laughs> I just kind of got tired of that. But that's kind of the attitude. Why do we take that attitude with the Lord? 
He'll never do us wrong. He never is on an ego trip. His ways are perfect. And so we're told to believe. And then confess. Believing should lead to confession. Let's talk about confessing. In Luke, I've kind of put a couple uh, scriptures on your outline. In Luke 12 and verse 8, it says, Everyone who acknowledges me before man, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. Are you willing to acknowledge? Are you willing to confess what God has done in your heart? That's the natural thing. You've got to tell it. It's, it's in me. I gotta, it's got to come out. It's got to come out. And so John chapter 12 says, Many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Whoa. Acts chapter 19, on the other hand, many became known, this became known to all the, the, uh, in, of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them as the gospel was working there. And it says, And the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was extolled, and also many of those who were, who were now believers came, and they were confessing. They were confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, but they were also confessing that we have messed up. And so, matter of fact, they were involved in some cults, and so they were throwing in their stuff. Said, Look what I was doing. <laughs> I don't want any part of it anymore. Start the bonfire. And it was a big one. In Acts chapter 2, then, it says this. We're talking about... Talking about confessing, it says that when Jesus Christ was proclaimed to be Lord, that many of the people were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter, well, what shall we do? And he says, brothers, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just as Abraham believed God, and then he was told to his offspring to proclaim his belief in God by circumcision. So we proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ. If a person has never been baptized, they are proclaiming that in baptism. And we so we rejoice in that. And so parents also proclaim their faith and hope in Jesus Christ in baptizing their children, just as Abraham had his children or his sons uh, circumcised. Likewise, on the Lord's Supper, we are confessing what we believe in the Lord's Supper. Every time we take of it, he says, as often as you eat this bread and, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, made a good confession. <laughs> he made a good confession. He says, before Pilate. What was his confession before Pilate? His confession before Pilate was that God rules over all things, right? When Pilate says, you know, I have authority to crucify you. So you don't have any authority except that God had given it to you. He says, do you understand? He says, you need to speak to me and tell me. He says, uh, he says greater is the punishment of the person that has delivered me to you. Right? And so he just, he wasn't trying to push himself, but he gave a good confession before Pilate. He's wanting to tell the truth. What's the result of confession? He says, Verse 10, for the heart one believes and is justified, but the mouth one confesses and is saved. We believe in our heart. That's where we're justified. We're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, made, we're declared to be righteous because of the righteousness we hold on to and holding to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But what about salvation? What does it mean? It means the forgiveness of sins, victory over sin, Satan, and death. In fact, it's kind of like the year of Jubilee has come when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the sovereign God, and he is my Savior. <laughs> We're proclaiming that, and even as we proclaim it with our mouth, our knees bow to him in humble submission. Well, let's look at that last section, verses 11 through 13. I call this the assurance of forgiveness. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing the riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's the foundation here? Look at the foundation in verse 11. For the scripture says, the scripture says. Where is the point of our assurance? The scripture says. God cannot lie. The scripture says. Okay, let's look at a few scriptures then to back that up. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is what? Breathed out or inspired by God. Don't you just love that? And it's profitable for you, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That's what it's good for. Doctrine, 
Teaching. How do we establish things? Build upon precept upon precept, line upon line. That's doctrine. For correction. Does anybody ever make any mistakes? Yeah. For reproof. Sometimes God says, you have made a, make, made a big mistake. That's wrong. Stop. Okay? Correction and reproof and instruction. Here's how you do it. That's what the scripture is good for. Psalm 12 and verse 6 and 7 point to the fact that sometimes people say to you, I remember having anybody say, well, there's so many, so many translations of the scripture. How can you believe any of them? Well, here's put it to the test. It says in Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver refined in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard them, guard us from this generation forever. You understand that God is sovereign over his scripture? Sometimes there's people that have a translation that comes. And it fades. Okay. The ones that he has, they're going to stay. God has ordained it so. It's good to search out and seek out a good translation and consult with people. But understand that God's the one that's in control. He, he's able to see his word be able to be understood. When we talk about his word, though, listen to how the description of the word, it's called the law of the Lord, and it's called the, the statutes of the Lord. Psalm 19 reads this way. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Reviving the soul. Uh, uh, the testimony of the Lord, again, this is the word of God, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. But when you talk about God's word, listen to this in Psalm 138 and verse 2. This is kind of a guiding principle for Christ's community Presbyterian church. Not a kind of, it is. This is what we hold really fast to when he says, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Or as it says in the King James, your name by your word. So when you exalt the word of God, you exalt his name. So what is the promise here? It is the scriptures. It's based on the scripture. And the scripture has the promise from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And that's the quote. Therefore it says, the Lord, behold, I am the one who has laid in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. Whoever believes in uh, will not be put to haste, not be in haste. Let's talk about that, that cornerstone for a minute. A cornerstone is more than, you know, sometimes we have a cornerstone in a building. I remember when I was young, we, 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 we rebuilt, we built on, excuse me, re, you know, we added on to the church uh, that I grew up in, and they built this massive building, and they, put a cornerstone that said what it was. It was dedicated to the Lord on a certain date. Okay, and when he talks about the cornerstone, this is the cornerstone where you took that out, the building would fall down. That's what he's talking about. All right, the cornerstone. Okay, it's a very important stone. And so he says, this cornerstone that's a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, a tested cornerstone. But it's also talked about it was rejected by men. So it's interesting, this principle from this scripture is described in the book of Psalms, in the book of Isaiah, the book of Zechariah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the book of Acts, Romans, Ephesians, and 1 Peter. Do you think God is telling us something? I mean, just stop and think about it. If he puts something in the scriptures that much, do you think what he's telling you is so very important? Yes. The true foundation of the kingdom of God is in this one cornerstone, and men rejected it. Men spit upon it. Men tossed it aside and said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Ah! But it's the chief cornerstone. And anyone who believes in that will not be put to haste. It's interesting. It means, another place, not be put to shame. Or you could say, will not be disappointed. If you're trusting in this cornerstone for forgiveness of sins, you'll never be disappointed. And let's look at it. Romans chapter 8. It says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Okay. 
Let's see if you can be disappointed or made to be in haste. Now, if you found out that you were trusting in something that wasn't right, what would you do? You'd be running to the mountains. Give me something else because this is not working out, right? All right, so who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Does Satan ever try to bring charges against God's elect? Daily, hourly, putting things in your ear that says, you're not really a child of God. You messed up more than anybody. You have really messed up this time. You'll never be accepted. Wait a minute. Who shall lay anything, anything, to the charge of God's elect? And then it says this. It is God who has justified you. God is the one who put that in motion. Man didn't come up with that. God did. But then it says this. And it is Christ who died. Yea. Rather that is even risen. And is at the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession for you. Whew. Did you get that? Where is the foundation of hope? It's in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he ascended on high where he sits at the right hand of God. And anything that anybody would ever lay a charge against one of God's elect, he says, I paid for that sin. I covered that sin. That's why he says nothing in all creation, not things in heaven, not on things on earth, not things under the earth, nor height, nor depth, nor anything other, any other creature shall ever, ever be able to separate us from the love of God because it's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, do we ever get weak in our faith? Yeah. You remember the time, Peter thought he was hot stuff, didn't he? He's just like us. Or, or, or like to say that, he's just like us, like um, this old preacher used to say that Peter put both, likes to put both feet in his mouth and wonder why he can't walk too well. <laughs> Peter says uh, to the Lord who's walking on the water, says, Lord, if it's you, come, tell me to come. Peter, come on. Peter's walking out there and then all of a sudden, uh, he starts to go down, right? What did Jesus say to him when he picked him up? He said, oh, little faith, why did you doubt? Have you had the, one of those moments this past week? If you're truthful, you'd say, yeah. Times I doubted. Times I got upset. Times I was anxious. And I cried to the Lord. And you know, I, I didn't drown like I thought I was too, going to. And he says to me, and to you, oh, little faith, why do you doubt? What do we do for that faith that may be small? Malachi has the words to us. Yeah. Or you of dis Italian descent may call him Malachi. Right? Malachi chapter 3. And what does he say? Bring the tithes into the storehouse. Do what I've told you to do. Trust in me. I'll take care of your needs, but give to me first. Right off the top, give to me first. Bring your tithes into the storehouse. And then he says this. Put me to the test. Put me to the test. When do we put him to the test? Every time we pray. Every time we believe him. Every time we confess our faith and hope in Jesus Christ, even on Sunday mornings as we are confessing together what we believe. Every time we confess to him that we're trusting in him alone for salvation, even in the Lord's Supper, putting him to the test to take care of us. So we come to the free offer of the gospel, and that is in verse 12 and 13, where it says that, in verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on the name of the Lord, or call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone, the free offer of the gospel. Uh, see, we don't know who God select are, so we're to just sound out. So everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Uh, indeed, it's, 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 we understand that there are some people who are hungry and those who are thirsty, and if you're, you're blessed if you're hungry and thirst after righteousness. But listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 22. It says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And he says, let all those who hear say, come. And... And let the one who is thirsty come 
and the one who desires to take the water of life without price. Ah, a righteousness that is not established by ourselves, but upon God. And that's why he says in Isaiah 55, Oh, everyone that is thirsty, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters and buy wine and milk. But he says this, without money and without price. For why do you labor for that which is not good? He said, let your soul delight in fatness and plenty and abundance. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we conclude with Acts chapter 4. John is here speaking and he says, or John and Peter, you know, they were, they had healed a man and they were called into question and says, let it be known unto you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that's the, that's the incarnate Savior, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, again, he's truly a man, whom God has raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well, and this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Again from Acts 13, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that by this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. And as we conclude from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.